I would like to introduce Christina Cavalieri, who is a faculty member with the Human Dimensions of Natural Resources Department at Colorado State University. Christina, if you are on, would you like to unmute yourself and join us? Good morning. Hello. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Okay. Well, welcome everyone to our next session. We are a few minutes early, but I think time is never our friend. So why not proceed ahead? Um, we, I, I, as, as mentioned, I'm a faculty member here in the Human Dimensions of Natural Resource uh, a department uh, at CSU, and my research really looks at tourism impacts um, and biocultural conservation. I run a tourism and conservation lab, research lab here. Um, I did my undergrad in the U.S., my master's in uh, Australia, and my PhD in New Zealand, but worked for many years in the industry in between, and so it's lovely to see uh, here uh, in this conference a mix of academics and applied industry practitioners. We certainly need that interchange uh, to further uh, conservation, which I know is, is a large focus of most of our work. So I, Stan, are you with us? Hopefully you're able to turn on your microphone and your camera just to make sure you're here. And then I will be happy to introduce you. Thank you, oh, I hope wonderful. you can hear me. Good morning, Stan, we can hear you. Good morning. Lovely to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. So I'll just take a moment to introduce you, Sam, and then if I miss anything, please feel free to fill us in before you begin. We have about a 20 to 25 minute presentation from you that we're very uh, grateful to have today, and then we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes for questions from uh, those of you that are joining us from around the world. So we are lucky to have Stan Rowland with us today, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Blue Climate Initiative a global collaborative engaged in protecting the oceans and reasonably and responsibly using its potential to mitigate climate change and other major environmental and social issues. Stan is also chairman and president of Te Tiora Society, an environmental nonprofit that sponsors scientific research and engages in conservation and community-based education programs in French Polynesia. He is also a member of the advisory board of Island Conservation, which focuses on preventing extinctions by removing invasive species from islands. Stan provides legal services to Pacific Beachcomber SC, which owns and manages several operations in French Polynesia, Polynesia including the Brando Resort on Te Tiora, which has established new standards in sustainability with deep sea water air conditioning, carbon neutral operations, and innovative environmental programs. Formerly, Stan was a partner in the San Francisco based law uh, firms of Alan Matkins, Pillsbury, and Thielen, and was managing partner of the Hong Kong offices of both Pillsbury and Thielen. Stan is a graduate of the University of California at Berkeley and Cornell Law School. So, we are very, very grateful, Stan, for your time today and for joining us. I know you'll share with us some, some exciting initiatives. Um, I will help you with time. Uh, as I mentioned, about 20 to 25 minutes for speaking. And then we'd like to leave about 10 to 15 minutes for questions, which I will help you with. I'll help read those from the platform. Uh, and so without further ado, Sam, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Christina. I appreciate that. I appreciate your time, uh, help with the time management. Um, I just wanna start off and say it's, it's uh, so wonderful to see so many people from around the world participating in this conference. Uh, the mere fact that you're participating in this conference means a couple of things. First, that you're concerned about the environment. And so undoubtedly, you know what a precarious position we are in. Never before in human history have global systems from forests to oceans to our atmosphere been at the level of risk that they are today. So it's never been more important for us all to work together on the environmental challenges we are facing. And second, the fact that you attend this conference means that you already know a fair amount about sustainable tourism. Other speakers are going to go into more detail about the amazing power and opportunity of sustainable, of sustainable tourism to help with environmental efforts. So I'm not going to go into much detail on that. What I wanted to do today is to focus on a program that we implemented in French Polynesia that I hope will serve as a model or example 
of the, the power of sustainable tourism. Uh, in fact, that's what that's the whole purpose behind what we did. We created a, a resort and environmental program in the middle of the Pacific. We didn't do it for what we could achieve there. We did it for what we could do on a more global impact. Um, and so I hope that that through this process will illustrate some of the powers of tourism. Uh, first, the power of tourism as a mechanism for conservation. Second, as a as a tour for edu as a as a tool for education. Third is a test bed or a living laboratory for solutions. And then finally, as a funding source, a spring bed for scientific research, conservation, education, and cultural preservation. With that, let me turn on some slides. And hopefully you can see those. Um, let me know if you don't see the, uh, the slides. Dan, that looks great. Thank you so much. Thank you, okay. Um, our flagship program started around 15 years ago in French Polynesia. For those of you not familiar with French Polynesia, it, um, it sits almost exactly in the center of the Pacific Ocean, immediately south of uh, Hawaii. So it's pretty much in the middle of nowhere, although uh, we like to think since we're focused on ocean related issues, it's, it's really in the middle of everywhere. But our story goes back even further. It goes back to the, the 60s uh, when Marlon Brando was filming Mutiny on the Bounty. And he fell in love with the leading lady and also this island that you see on the screen, the island of Tedaroa. So he acquired that back in the 60s. We worked with him on a plan for uh, conservation development, modest development on the island to protect it, uh, to provide the economic engine to protect it. But he passed away before we were able to do that. And so we had, later on acquired, after his death, we acquired the island uh, back in around 2006. But we, what we acquired was a blank slate. We had a, a remote uninhabited atoll where we had the opportunity to do whatever we wanted to. So what, what, what would we do? Well, one of the things we wanted to do is we said, well, this, this is kind of a 60s concept. We said, well, let's see if we can get everybody to work together on a common good. Let's see if we could get the scientists, the business people, uh, the environmentalists, the teachers, the local community, all working together collaboratively. So that was one of our one of our objectives. As a, it, it sounds ridiculous now in this polarized world that we're in, but that's what we thought we could accomplish: pulling everybody together to to work on on the common good. Uh, thinking that environmentalism is a common goal that everybody, no matter political perspective, should should share an interest in. And then they said, "How can we take a small island and have it truly?" meaningful global impact. So what did we do? Let me see if I can move this slide here. So first, we created a nature reserve, putting 90% of the atoll into a permanent nature reserve. Second, we established a nonprofit organization, name of Teddy Aurora Society, to serve as the steward of the atoll. And this is kind of an unusual move to put a, a nonprofit organization in charge of the conservation and sustainable development of, a, of an atoll, including the, the business programs, but that's what we did. Um, and, we, and we tasked that uh, nonprofit into developing a conservation and sustainable use plan for the entire atoll. Then we started plans for building the Brando Resort, uh, which would be the economic engine for everything that we did. And having this financial engine is so critical to any conservation development. Um, it, it, it sustainability involves not just uh, environmental sustainability, but very much financial sustainability. Philanthropy is terrific to get programs started, but it's not sustainable in the long term. We have to find ways in which we can incorporate um, uh, financial sustainability into environmental programs on a regular basis. So with a brand, we had uh, a couple of goals. First was to establish that luxury and environmental responsibility are not mutually exclusive. Sometimes sacrifice is necessary for environmental projects, but sometimes good planning works as well. So we created as one of the most highly rated resorts in the world. In fact, for several years, it, uh, when it first opened, it was rated as the number one resort in the world. Uh, but it's one also that is, uh, that I think is one of the most sophisticated from an environmental perspective of any uh, resort in the world. It's Platinum LEED certified, uh, not just on a building, which is kind of a, um, I think it's a, 
that's an easy solution to uh, platinum lead certified, but we have it if the entire campus is platinum lead certified. That means that we don't just have a building that that has dirty water that that's not being counted as, as part of this lead platinum building or uh, dirty sources of energy coming in. Everything on the entire island has achieved a platinum lead certified um, uh, certification. Um, so it's a combining, and, and, and what we've tried to do is to hide the environmental programs in the sense that a uh, guest don't recognize that. They don't realize that what they're doing is, is involved in environmental resort until they start talking to us, but you don't see it. You don't experience it, that. And that was one of our goals and objectives. The second, we wanted to blend the resort with nature. Although this is a picture that you, from up above, from off the island, you don't see any building, any structure. There's nothing over water, so it's all blended in with nature. Third, we wanted to make sure that not only did we not have any, any ad adverse environmental impact, we wanted to have a positive impact. Uh, positive environmental impact. So we started at the very beginning before we did anything, conduct the baseline studies of the atoll so that we could establish what impact we had and monitor it from a scientific perspective from that going forward. And then fourth, we wanted to be carbon neutral. And that's a real challenge because um, a lot of French Polynesia, like most islands around the world, re rely very heavily upon um, diesel fuel. Uh, it's imported generally from the Middle East at great expense. And so how can you have a carbon neutral um, resort uh, operations in the middle of the Pacific. One of the biggest challenges is, is we didn't want to flood the entire island with uh, solar panels. Um, that, would, that would be uh, uh, an eyesore to say the least. So we said, let's, let's reduce um, our energy use. That's one of the, mo the most efficient and, and, and cost-effective ways to uh, conserve energy, to, to, um, uh, to um, minimize energy use. So we, we implemented um, a kind of a novel program. Um, we're one of the first organizations in the world to commercialize deep sea water air, con air conditioning. So what we actually do is we take uh, water from the, from the deep ocean and we pull it up. It's, we have a pipe that goes down about a half a mile down into the ocean, pull up water that comes up at about 40 degrees. And we circulate that through the entire resort. resort. In a way that the guests don't know it, they, for all they know that there's a regular air conditioning system in there, but we circulate cold water through all the operations, the staff housing, the, the laboratories, everything, entire island is cooled with deep ocean water. And then we take this ocean water, which never touches the environment and return it back into the ocean at a level where the temperature is about the same. It comes back at about 47 degrees. And so we drop it down to where the ocean temperature is about seven degrees. So it has no impact on the environment takes very little energy. The water that is, is comes up through the pipe is actually pushed up from the pressure down below, pushes the water up. So it's a so operating costs are, are minimal. In fact, we're in a situation where we have basically unlimited free cold now. And in fact, we are so thrilled when we turned it on, we just blasted cold because it's no, no environmental impact. And we actually just had guests complaining, asking for blankets. And so we have we've moderated the system since then. But this uh, system actually saves us about a million and a half dollars of energy um, every year and saves us um, from emitting over 2,000 tons of CO2 each year. It's a system that we've modeled there. And uh, in fact, the government of French Polynesia has now uh, adopted it and built the largest uh, seawater air conditioning system in the world in French Polynesia for a hospital. And we're hoping that this idea, this concept spreads throughout the world. Uh, again, using, using what we're doing there on the island as a test bed for other operations. Then for, for uh, the remaining energy needs, for, we first turn to solar panels. We lined, instead of putting the panels all over the place, we lined the airstrip with solar panels. Uh, as you know, airstrips typically have nothing on the sides of them for, for, um, um, for safety reasons, but we, that gives a great opportunity to put uh, solar panels. And so the entire airstrip on the island is lined with solar panels. And then we have uh, passive, um, uh, passive solar heating for water as well. That, this, the combination of this, these two provide about 70% of our energy needs, but that's not enough. That's, not, uh, that's enough. What you need is something to, cover, to provide for those rainy days and those nights. What do you do when there's no sun out? And so for that, we had a backup for a diesel, diesel engines, but not, not, um, they don't run on fossil fuel. Instead, they run on coconut oil. And so we have a coconut oil fired diesel generators 
to provide our remaining 30% of our energy needs. And, and, and in fact, now I look at uh, the coconuts, I, I just think of them as small batteries for the amount of energy each one of them can contain, which we use then use at, a, at the facility. Um, then we have various other programs there, which we've experimented on. on. Um, there's, we have a, uh, a comprehensive um, uh, uh, an innovative recycling program that turns a food digester that turns food waste into compost in 24 hours. It's, it's remarkable. Uh, we crush our glass and use it on the, our local roads and then cement mixing. We, um, water is always a challenge on, a, on an island um, uh, and we have to be very careful about saltwater intrusion in the under, underground lens. And so we collect water off of the surface of all the buildings and use that we process that water, which is a lot easier to process into clean water than using seawater uh, or other sources. And then we, um, then for the water treatment facility, trying a, an innovative approach. Um, again, an experiment that uh, we hope to, to uh, advance in other locations where the water actually circulates through a series of rocks at different sizes. And through that, through that process, it oxygenates the rocks. It kind of works essentially as a tidal basin where the water moves up, uh, up and down through the rocks, it ox oxygenates it. And then we use tropical plants that have actually planted in the, um, uh, in the water treatment facility that extract nitrogen and other elements that we uh, that need to be removed from the water. So it's a very efficient system. Again, something that we would like to see exported from around the world. Uh, and then we have a we have an organic farm, uh, which is a lot lot of fun and provides the freshest fruit possible. We have uh, um, beehives for local honey, makes uh, from coconut trees and the local flowers. It's 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 remarkable. Um, but I, now I want to circle back to the nonprofit that I mentioned earlier. I mentioned that we start off with a, um, at the very beginning, we established this uh, nonprofit organization called Teddy Rora Society. Then we appointed as the uh, steward of the Atoll and put in charge of running our scientific research, conservation, education, and cultural programs. Um, a group you see here is uh, standing in front of our, our, of our dry lab. We have a dry lab, a wet lab, and a dorm front for 20 researchers. Um, stand in the front, uh, a group of our guides and uh, members of our team, and also President Obama, who um, spent a month, month with us. Um, we're very privileged to have a, a lot of uh, dignitaries and, and notables uh, attending, uh, coming to the, um, to the Brando. And uh, what we're doing there is we host researchers coming in from around the world. So we have researchers coming in from University of California, University of Washington, uh, University of Santa Barbara, Oxford, Cambridge, Duke, Stanford, the Smithsonian, uh, New University of New Zealand, Scripps, Duke, um, all around the world. But we haven't yet had, as far as I know, anybody from Colorado State. So we're, we're hoping that following this conference, we have some, uh, some applicants from Colorado State and the other universities are participating in this, in this conference who you will attend. Um, the, um, well, in, in terms of scientific research, we work on a variety of different issues. Um, these mo most of the most of them are ocean related. Um, uh, they are cover things from ocean acidification, ocean warming, coral bleaching, shark ecology, uh, turtle migration. We have humpback whales studies on that. So there's a lot of different types of research which are done there. But there's one program I wanted to talk about in particular that illustrates the type of program that we're trying to implement to have a broader impact. And that's what I encourage everybody working on conservation programs to think about the broader impact that these programs can have. And this program involves the uh, most dangerous animal in the world. And um, you think about the most dangerous animal in the world, some of people might think about sharks and others. And I guess the truth is the most dangerous animal in the world is probably humans. But, um, but that's not what our research, I, so I guess our research is on the second most dangerous animal in the world, which happens to be the lowly mosquito. Mo lo this mosquito is an incredibly dangerous animal because of malaria, chingunya, Zika, all sorts of diseases. So it's, it's a common vector for a, a number of diseases throughout the world. So we, we want to do for, for health reasons and also for guest, uh, um, uh, guest uh, uh, comfort is to eliminate the mosquitoes. So how do you do this? How do you get rid of mosquitoes in an environmentally friendly way without the use of pesticides? 
Well, we came up with, with an idea. We sterilized the male mosquitoes. So what we did is we sterilized 3 million male mosquitoes. And then we rele released them over time. This is a picture shows some, uh, some of our the participants from the uh, uh, French lab, Institute Louis Marlade that conducted the uh, program, releasing the, the as so we released these um, sterile male mosquitoes over a period of 11 months and completely eradicated all of the uh, male mosquitoes on the island. And you can imagine what this was, the first male mosquitoes lots of females, the final ones we're releasing in the 11th month, there are no mosquitoes left on the island. And that's actually the only purpose of the male mosquitoes. They don't bite, the, the only purpose is to mate. And so they had a, um, a, fu a futile existence at the end, but I guess we're very happy. Um, this program is again, an example of what we're trying to do to make these programs have a global impact. Now, if, you know, um, the government of French Polynesia has now built a new facility on the island of Tahiti that will be able to produce an astonishing 10 million sterile male mosquitoes in a week. That, that, is, that, that will have the capacity to actually eradicate mosquitoes on an island the size of Bora Bora, which is just incredible. So anyway, it's a t t using, using this island as a model example, using our work to see how we can have a greater good. Um, we also have a, a fairly extensive conservation program for protecting and enhancing all the animal uh, life uh, on the island uh, from marine, marine birds, uh, marine life, coconut crabs, and, 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 and turtles. And by the way, when I uh, talk about turtles, I just want to mention one thing real quickly that I uh, thought was interesting. Um, during our, our turtle conservation efforts, we learned a, an important lesson about community involvement. The first, the way we started to protect the turtles was a fairly standard way. We, we have rangers who go out at night, and turtles, of course, nest uh, during the night. They come on shore during the night and nest. And so we had rangers out there trying to stop the poachers as they came onto the island. It's a very expensive and difficult process. And uh, it's, um, it, it's, it's, uh, hard, it's, it's hard to have that sort of impact we wanted. But we had a, we complemented that with a local education program, talking to the local children, talking about the, the ability to, um, the, the importance of the children being able to uh, understand and, and see the turtle, live turtles, swim with the turtles, understand that they migrate for thousands of miles, taught the local children uh, about, the, uh, about the turtles. And before long, the local the children were shaming anybody in the community that was eating turtles. And now the, our turtle population on the island is actually exploding. So it's community involvement is, is ever so critical. Um, we also have a rodent control, pro uh, we also, as part of our bird, uh, bird protection program, we have a rodent control uh, program. Uh, the rodents are brought in by um, the European uh, explorers early on, and they, uh, they feed on the ground nesting birds. And so uh, just this June, we uh, actually eradicated all of the, the rats on the island and that we using this as part of another experiment to see what the impact would be on coral reefs. We have a hypothesis that the that by getting rid of the um, the rats, it'll not only improve the bird population, but it'll increase some nutrient levels in the water, which will add to the health and resiliency of the coral reefs, which are already under enormous threat from uh, ocean acidification and ocean warming. So boosting their uh, health through added nutrients from the marine uh, birds we think will, will be very effective and expect to be able to have results in a year or two to be able to scientifically prove uh, our hypothesis. Um, we also have a local education program where we combine science uh, with indigenous knowledge. It's, it's a, sometimes it's a challenge matching those two, but I think we've developed a way to do that. And I'm happy to talk to anybody later on about uh, our approach on that. Uh, and then finally, we have a community. We have well, we have some amazing rangers and, and guides, uh, uh, key to our operations. And then we have community outreach, which I alluded to earlier, is a very important part of our of our um, operations. Um, we um, we think it's absolutely uh, critical to have that outreach. We learn so much from local knowledge. We sometimes laugh at the um, the idea that so many people. 
will uh, come in with these great knowledge from the as foreigners coming in saying we have an idea we have a solution to save their problems and the locals will say well you know like marine protected areas will say we've we've had the Rahui concept here in French Bal nature for thousands of years and they actually have a more nuanced more sophisticated program than the typical uh, non-Polynesian marine protected area that's brought in. So listening to the indigenous population, local knowledge, incorporating that is so, so absolutely critical. Um, but when we're working on all these programs, we realized that what we were doing was fine, but we weren't doing anything about the biggest environmental crisis that humankind has ever faced, which is climate change. So as a result of that, we, we launched about three years ago is the Blue Climate Initiative. And this is, not, this is a global program that's UN endorsed by the United Nations Ocean Decade. We bring in our, our network of scientists from around the world, sports from all the world, working on ocean-based solutions to climate change. We've had uh, a few different programs. We start off realizing that we're not the experts in this area. We brought in, uh, back in 2020, we brought in some of the uh, world experts, uh, global experts on climate change and ocean-related issues brought them together and uh, put their ideas together on what they view as most promising transformational opportunities and put them into the book um, that's available on our website. And I'm happy to send a copy to anybody that's interested in. What we're trying to do is not just look at incremental change. The, the issues are so major that we, we really think that focus has to be on transformational change. We need the incremental change too, but we really, we're running out of time. Um, uh, we, we went to COP uh, last year, and it's just so uh, absolutely frustrating and disturbing and sad that there's so much talk about ambitions uh, about carbon neutrality in 2050 and 2060, and very little talk about what people are doing tomorrow. And 2050, 2060 is going to be too late to be able to tackle these issues. We've got to work on them now. And so this is what we're trying to do. We had a community awards program uh, last year actively looking for community-based solutions to climate change. And then we had a million dollar Ocean Innovation Prize, which we awarded uh, at a summit this year, uh, million, where we actually worked on specific programs, where we offered a million dollars for the best technological or entrepreneurial-based solutions uh, to, to climate change. Uh, we now have several programs underway. Um, I just mentioned two of them. One of them uh, is a... Um, uh, it's not actually on this slide, but it's deep sea mining. Deep sea mining is an issue that's really disturbing. Now that we've finally had the ability to go to the deep ocean, now they want to begin mining it. And it's um, we just uh, participated in a um, in a um, uh, in a op ed that showed up in uh, Time magazine yesterday on the deep sea mining issue, and it's a copy of that is on our website. Uh, it's by Sylvia Earle and Dan Kamen, uh, which we helped put together. Uh, talking about the threat of deep sea mining and the impact that it's going to have on the ocean. I hope that you'll take a look at that ba major issue uh, and, and one that we need to move on very, very quickly, or we're going to be way behind the mining companies on that. Um, another effort is uh, to take on, to capitalize on what we did with the Brando uh, and make it carbon neutral, is try to make all of Tahiti carbon neutral. That's a very ambitious plan, but, some, but a goal that we have. Um, now, if I could, I'd like to ask Paul to put on a video which summarizes um, the, um, the summit we had in French Polynesia last year. It has some, it's a highlight film, and I think that you, uh, hopefully you'll find, that, find it interesting. Paul? Ce qui se passe sur la terre va avoir des conséquences sur la mer. Et ce que l'on ressent sur la mer va arriver sur la terre. Le Blue Climate Summit, qui commence dès aujourd'hui, est l'opportunité pour nous, peuple de l'océan, peuple océanien, de vous démontrer que nous sommes des territoires d'opportunités et de solutions. I think that we have not only ignored the ocean, dumped our waste in it, treated it like a, a garbage pit for, for decades. So the real question is, how do we change that dialogue? 
And for me, this conference is a chance to learn from indigenous communities, to learn from practices that have evolved on small islands, on communities that have been dependent on the ocean. L'objectif premier, c'est d'éduquer la l'être humain. Parce que si on veut, si on veut atténuer ou si on veut éliminer la pollution, il faut éduquer l'être humain parce que c'est qui le premier pollué, c'est l'être humain. For me, Tahiti is the logical place to hold a summit uh, uh, for the Blue Climate Initiative. Uh, many people say Tahiti, well, that's the, that's the middle of nowhere, and to which I reply, on the contrary, it's the center of everywhere. We have a chance to hold the planet steady if we take seriously the objective of maintaining the natural systems that are still working. Old growth forests, places in the ocean that we know are really representative of, of what the world was before we consumed so much of it. The last thing we should consider doing is going into the deep sea and undertaking anything that is going to disrupt it. In the last 250 years, too much of the world gave it up. They forgot. But in Kaikinui, you did not forget. And we're grateful. We're honored to be here. Thank you, Paul. Um, I, I would just like to conclude with a, a quote um, from President Obama. He said, change will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the change we seek. So with that, I just wanted to say, I, I hope we can all work together um, on this common objective, environmental protection. And I thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. That was fascinating. What uh, amazing examples you shared with us of what can be done. Um, and so we now have an opportunity to hear from some of our participants. Good to ask some questions. There is a Q&A button, um, and I believe that's what the organizers are asking us to use. So for the people who are attending, um, if you wanna go ahead and enter your questions, I can attempt to help uh, read them and have Stan uh, share with us his thoughts on your specific questions. So if you wanna send those through, um, we are open and available. Uh, maybe while we wait, Stan, I can ask you a question to just sure. elaborate a little bit. There were so many elements to your presentation that I found fascinating and very helpful, and I look forward to sharing with my students. Um, I myself am working on some NPA projects in Norway at the moment, um, and so lots, lots of information that's resonated um, and, and I find fascinating. Could you share with us just generally some of the roadblocks you're seeing to climate adaptation strategies? I know you mentioned being at, um, at some multilateral meetings and seeing that frustration. Are there some areas you can illuminate for us that we might be able to focus on in our work as academics and practitioners based on your experience? Well, I, I, I go back to one of the issues I talked about earlier, and that is getting the, um, getting the involvement of the local community. Uh, it, is, it is so, so critical. Um, and I'll use French Polynesian as an example, but in terms of coming in for whether or not it's a marine protector in the water or on the land to protect uh, some of the forests or the jungles there, um, if, 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 it, come, if it, it appears as though it's a foreign organization, non-French, French Polynesian organization, non-Polynesian organization coming in telling them what to do, they don't appreciate that. And any of us can appreciate that if we sat here and said, okay, if there's a foreign country coming in and telling us what we're gonna do here in Colorado or here in San Francisco or wherever, you've got to say, hey, wait, listen, we know what to do. 
working working locally. And it's, it takes a little longer time, but that's the way that you're going to have longer term and more effective results. And so that's one of the things which we we try very hard to do. And then and just try to be supportive and be supportive of the local efforts rather than than um, top down uh, direction giving. And so that's that's the approach I think is uh, is is really helpful. But now is a time that uh, we have so many opportunities to protect areas, whether or not it's in the ocean or land. Um, these 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 provide um, key areas that that help to protect the the broader biodiversity. And so, any efforts that we can make to protect them would um, would be terrific. That's fantastic. Thanks, Dan. It really illuminates to me the connection, the biocultural connection, right? That human humans and um, our intact ecosystems rely so inherently on one another in that respect. We do have two questions coming in here. Um, the first one would be uh, from, from a different app that people are watching uh, from. What challenges are encountered when strengthening ocean climate action? Well, for first off, there's a bit of an education process. I mean, I get to the very beginning, people don't recognize the connection between the climate uh, and the ocean. And so that took, a, that took that and still take, it's, a, it's still a major effort. Um, yeah, every, I, I think all, everybody on the, uh, uh, attending the conference now knows that every other breath we take comes from the ocean. The ocean, the health of the ocean is so vital to, to the climate and, and the disruption of the ocean systems is causing already problems with weather, problems, extremes, extreme weather, weather events, it's causing billions of dollars of damage already. And so part of it is just that education process and then slowing down these destructive uh, efforts. And I mentioned deep sea mining. It's, we're tinkering with systems that have been in place for literally billions of years. And it's so important that carbon collection sequestration system that carbon collection sequestration system, carbon capture and all that is so important for the whole, uh, for carbon dioxide absorption from the atmosphere. And you disrupt that system by disrupting by these huge sediment plumes that we created on the ocean floor, plus the mining tailings created on the ocean surface, it disrupts in ways which we don't even yet understand. But we do know anything we do on the bottom of the ocean will be permanent. There's no no restoration, the systems are so slowly growing down, down there, won't restore. So, so there's a lot of areas we just need to, to back off of and just and, 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 and appreciate how important it is for to our everyday life, to the weather we experience every day, the droughts and everything else we're experiencing. Thank you for, for answering that question. The next question we have is close to my heart. Uh, a lot of my work has been on critically examining the sustainable development goals uh, so one of the questions here is how can tourism help in achieving sustainable development goal 14, life below water? And you did touch on that a bit with your presentation, but we'd love to hear more. Well, one, one of the things that um, I think that resorts, uh, resort owners and operators need to appreciate is, is their key asset really is not the, 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 the beds that they have, the, the kitchen equipment. What people are coming for is so often the, the natural environment around them. That is really their key asset. And they need to respect and protect that. The more um, people don't come to, to just sit in their room, they come to, to enjoy the splendor, the beauty, the protection. And so I, I think that there is a real, um, real way in which we can get uh, tourist organizations working together to say, yes, let's protect this asset of ours. Let's, not, let's be proactive, let's not just worry about ourselves, but let's let's be active and let's get our individuals, people are coming, let's get them to pay us, uh, to contribute to a small fund that will go to support the area around us and get them to, to be more involved in it. Um, you know, sustainability is so much more, uh, the tourism and uh, sustainable tourism so much more uh, uh, about things other than uh, just not rewashing your towels, that's important. But but you can take a, like we what we try to do is to take a small, small resort in the basically in the middle of nowhere and say how can we have a broader impact how can we use it as a test bed and example any resorts around the world can do that it's a great educational opportunity for the guests that come in as they learn about about it get them to love the nature that's surrounding them and then um, they'll bring that back to their home communities and it'll, ha it'll have a broader impact 
Thanks again, Dan. Um, we have two more questions that have come in. The first one is, is building on what you were just speaking about. Uh, other than community engagement and blending building structures with the environment, how do you keep an authentic tourism component? So we talk a lot about in tourism, you know, authenticity and, and that kind of topic. And I just thought maybe you'd have some more thoughts on that. Well, you know, one of the things which we try to do originally, and let me just talk about the building itself uh, and then talk about the programs. The building itself, what we try to do is to bring the outdoors in and try to say, how, how can we do that? How can we have the outdoor dining experiences? How can, how can we have uh, the main dining? Uh, we have it under a, what we refer to as a fari pote. So people eat outside and you're in nature, you're around it all the time. So it's not... You're not in a tall high rise building if you can have that experience you build the building that brings in nature into into the the, the experience inside and then we also have the, the guide program uh, is so important we have the amazing naturalist guides that bring people out into the nature they have programs with other bikes and everything that make it easy for them and they're fascinated by it and a shocking thing that we found we actually found that one of our most popular tours is our back of the house tour where people are interested to see um, see our, all of our renewable energy, sustainable technologies in, in operation. So we actually bring them down into our seawater air conditioning systems to let them see how, we look at the recycling program and they, they're amazed. And many people take this, take this and go back, I'm gonna bring this back. This is great. I'm gonna do this in my community, in my company, whatever. And that, that's, a, that's an educational tool in itself. So I think it's a combination of the physical plant and the programs that you implement. That's fantastic. Thanks again, Stan. Yeah, back of the house tours, I find fascinating. But of course, I'm a little biased because it's my field. So it's good to hear that you're having that response from uh, 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 visitors and guests who are not necessarily tourism experts or, or tourism and in, tourism involved. Um, okay, so we have our next question here, which I also find very interesting. French Polynesia is French speaking. Uh, did you encounter linguistic or cultural barriers during the study? And how were you able to convince the local community about protection of the sea? So it's this combination of um, language uh, challenges and conservation, because we know that English is such a dominant language. Um, and then also, how were you able to, what were some strategies to convince local the local community about sea protection? Well, you know, the... Um... Part of it is is really um, kind of getting out of the way in a way, but from trying to be to be helpful and then getting out of the way. Um, I, I, the Polynesian, fortunately, unlike Hawaii, for example, where the Polynesian culture is is really gone, as far as I I know. I mean, it's just it's, it just seems to have been largely wiped out. In French Polynesia and other places in this in the South Pacific, Polynesian culture is really alive and well and really strong. You can walk down the streets in in Papeete, the main city. And you hear the, this Tahitian music and you peek in the door and there's little, you know, little children doing the Tahitian dance, not, not, for, um, not for shows, not for performances, but because that's part of their culture. And it's expressive, that's part of their life. It's, it's, they, and and they, they have this love of the ocean, this connection to the ocean that many of us, I don't think will ever have because they, they grew up with this incredible connection. And those people that have that, that tie to the, to the ocean is supporting them. And then, of course, there's a, this part of the community that's now growing up with their, their iPhones and, and all the rest, and, and and you know, find you know, growing up on videos, and they don't they don't know much about the um, island culture, and so part of it is educating them and bring that in. And we always use local elders. We don't. I would never go in there and try to talk to a Poly, Polynesian children. That'd be the worst. That'd be the biggest mistake I could make. But we're working with some amazing local elders who are really terrific in terms of, uh, you know, w working collaboratively with them. And then we have a school program where we have a, um, we're teaching a Blue Climate Initiative has a program that's adopted by the school system throughout, throughout French Polynesia, where we teach about ocean climate issues from a scientific perspective, but blended in with indigenous knowledge and indigenous approaches. And that's gotten into the public schools. So it's another way to, to amplify our voice. And um, uh, using using the school systems and the, the the wonderful perspective that French Polynesia uh, leaders have on on ocean protection, they're, they're the leaders. They really are. It's 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 helping them. It's doing what we can to facilitate their efforts. 
Fantastic. Well, we've come to the end of our session. We did have two more questions, but I'm not sure we have the time. So perhaps that's a question. These questions are um, an option to ask via email or uh, in a coffee break. Um, uh, but we do really appreciate your time, Stan, and, and the information that you shared with us today is really valuable. Uh, and we're so grateful for you joining us today. So thanks again for everything. Thank you, Christina. Thank you very much.